you've seen your invite, you've seen what we're going to be covering tonight. Uh, basically, you won't have heard of us because we're a boutique company. Uh, we operate on the central coast and the uh, northern part of Sydney mainly. Um, we, uh, we do introduction evenings like this so that you can understand where we come from and our philosophy with our clients. We, we tend to work over a long period of time with our clients to really help them do life-changing financial matters. In other words, uh, yes, we can show you how to save five or $10,000 in tax, uh, but that's not gonna change your life. If I show you how to make 10 grand tonight, that's gonna be very nice, but it's not gonna change your life. So what we do is we work with people on life-changing strategies financially. And so we wanna demonstrate that, and the best way to do that is not through an ad in the newspaper, but through an introductory evening such as this. So that's why we've invited you along. Just in case you're wondering where the hell we got your name from, it's just random. We, don't, we, we just have random lists out of the paper or out of the tele, uh, telephone directory or wherever it is, I don't know. So it's all very random, but uh, thank you for coming. Um, I myself, just so you know who I am, I myself have been in the industry about 30 years now, I, uh, about 35 years, time flies, doesn't it? I initially studied risk management at a place called Lloyd's of London. That's London, England. I always like to get it out of the way straight up because I've lost my accent, but I'd like you to know where I come from. Have I lost the accent? No, probably not. I, uh, I, um, I then moved uh, into the insurance industry in the UK, uh, uh, mainly concentrating more on superannuation and did the same when I came over here. I worked with National Mutual. Any of you old enough to remember National Mutual? Yeah, some of you may, may not. Um, you're allowed to nod. Doesn't mean you're old if you remember National Mutual. Um, uh, and then I, I, I sort of um, I developed more into the direct property, direct finance, direct shares. Uh, I've spoken all over the UK, all over Australia. And I guess my aim tonight is that um, you walk away glad that you come, a little bit more motivated, glad that you missed Family Food Fight. Have you seen that show? Oh my God. <laughs> I like food shows, but I don't like that one. Anyway, I'm going to do much better than that. Uh, I've, I've made some food for you. I've been in the kitchen, so stick around afterwards. We've got to give you a tablet, so I'll talk to you about that later as, uh, as to how we process that. And as I said, uh, I've got some food for you and tea and coffee and things, so don't rush off. Uh, sort of settle back and have a little, little bit of light supper at the end, all right? Just a couple of housekeeping things. If you don't know, just behind this wall here are the toilets. Um, if you could turn your phone off or to silent, that would be great help. And that's the housekeeping. Yep, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, okay. So what I want to do is I want to subtitle tonight how to make money. Is that all right? Much better than food fight family. Um, how to make money. And as you understand, I'm talking about how to make serious money. So, the first thing I want to do is I want to share with you a fact. A fact that kept me motivated, a fact that kept me going, especially when times are, you know, tough and roller coaster life is on the downturn and stuff like that. A fact that sort of woke me up and I'm hoping it has some sort of impact on you, a similar impact that it did have on me. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, most people fail financially. Most people fail financially. I like to share that because that should shock you. And it should also, you know, lots and lots of people I meet feel that it's, you know, not going to happen to them or they probably not even woken up to planning ahead financially or, or whatever. It depends what stage in life you're at. Um, what do I mean by they fail financially? What I mean by they fail financially is that for most people, and it really doesn't seem to matter where their income level is or what their standard of living level is, but for most people at some point in their life, that standard of living comes down. The belt has to get tightened, the money has to get counted more closely. When does that happen? That tends to happen in retirement. Because if the penny hasn't dropped yet, folks, the only uh, money you can maintain your standard of living on during retirement is whatever money you've set aside for that time in your life. And if you haven't set enough aside for that time in your life, you're going to cop it. You can't survive. You're going to have to pull the, pull the reins in. Um, there was an ad Westpac Bank put on telly uh, about seven or eight years ago. It said something like, 82% of people's retirement fund money will run out by the time they're 79, before 80. Run out. 
I don't know about you, but uh, I don't want to be 82 years of age standing at a bus stop in the pouring rain with my little bag of shopping because I can't afford a cab. Hell me, I want a chauffeur. You know, why not? I want life to get better. Because as, as we get older, uh, we're going to get more doddrier, aren't we? I don't know if doddery is a word, but you know what I mean, right? We're gonna, it's going to get harder, and we're going to need more money to make life easier as we get older. But of course what happens is people carry the same spending patterns through into retirement that they had while they were working, generating income. And so what they do is they go on trips now. They haven't got to get up for work. So they go, you know, around to Americas or they do the Europe or Asia or they go on a few cruises and they buy the grandkids stuff. And then suddenly they hit mid-70s and go, eek, the money's running out. We better stop all this. And that's actually when you need more money, I think. But then it occurred to me, uh, oh, you see, a, a, a statistic hit me. It said something. It said that uh, if you make it to age 60, statistically, you're going to live another 30 odd years. 30 odd years on your own money. 30 odd years to, to, to survive for. So I ask people, if you retired tomorrow, how many years could you survive on what you've got right now? How many years would you last? Some people say, I can, I'd only last 10 years. Some people say five, some people say two or three, and some say less than one. Because that's what happens. You, you stop work, you've got no income coming in, you've got to survive on whatever money you've got. But then I thought, hey, that's the doom and gloom side of it. That's the necessity side of it, if you like. 30 years retired I'm going to be. 30 years and I don't have to set the alarm clock anymore. 30 years and I can do what the hell I like whenever I like. And when I sit down with people and I say, what do you want to do for that 30 years of your life? 30 years, that's about one third of your life. And you don't have to get up for work anymore. So you can do what the hell you like whenever you like. What do you want to do with that time in your life? And most people say to me, I want to be financially secure. Well, that's the wrong answer, folks. Why is that the wrong answer? Because it's like, how long's a piece of string? Financial security to some people means something different to others. And if you don't know specifically what you want, how the hell are you going to plan for it? Because planning is crucial. So what we need to do, one of the first steps if we want to make serious money is take control of what we want out of life. It's to say to ourselves, what do we want? What do we want to do for like the longest holiday in your life? I'm going to go and do the Great Wall of China. I'm going to do Base Camp 1 at Everest. I'm going to get an open top red Alfa Romeo and I'm going to drive around Italy, all the little country towns, you know. I'll do Venice and Rome and all of that, you know. But I want to go on a safari, you know one of those posh ones with the silk curtains and the lions and tigers and elephants jumping around. And I want to go and have a cup of coffee. And you say, what's so unusual about that cup of coffee? And I say, this cup of coffee is in a restaurant in a cafe in the south of France. I've never been to the south of France. I had a honeymoon in Paris, but I've never been to the south. I'm from London. Paris isn't far, but I've never been to the south of France. And I've seen it on a James Bond movie or something, and all the Ferraris are whizzing around, and there's multi-million dollar yachts below in the harbour. Costs about 40 bucks for a cup of coffee, I think. But I'm going to go there. What do you want? I recommend you get a bucket list. You start realising what you want to get out of life. Most people let life happen to them. Most people fail financially. Just to prove that, here is their average incomes during retirement. How they averaged it out over those years they were retired. 86.5% on an average of the pension, basically. Yep, $300 a week. 86.5% is most people, isn't it? Come on, you know, I just said to you, you can nod if you want. You can't get that question wrong, right? No one's going to laugh at you if you nod, because that is definitely most people. That's a bit sad and sorry, isn't it? Because that's most people by a long, long way. Look up the other end. About 1.5% of people have an average income of more, more than $700 a week. Now, I don't mind telling you I earn more than $700 a week, and my hunch is that most of you do too. And I'd like to stay that way. In fact, I want more money when I retire. But that's me. So that means we've got to do something different to most people around us. If you think about it, what we do is we learn from most people around us subconsciously. We were never ever taught at school the subject how to make money. What teachers do, and if you're a teacher, I take my hat off to you because it's one of the toughest jobs. So the teachers do all right, but what we're te teaching kids is to how to go and get a job. 
And you say, what's wrong with that? My old mum, I had a daddy died when I was two, so all I had to lean on was my mum's advice and she was like most people. So I say to her, I want more money. She says, go and get another job. So even before I left school, I had three jobs on a weekend. What does that teach us? What everything is teaching us is that the way to make money is to work for money, work for money, work for money. Now, of course we have to go and work and we should all work hard. But the rich learn how to get money working for them. I'm going to show you how they do it. They learn to get money working for them. And that's what we need to do. And it's a shame we're never taught it, because if we were taught it from the very beginning, we would all be doing it, and, and, and we wouldn't be scared of it. It would come naturally to us, and it's possible to achieve. But what do most people do? Let's learn the mistakes of most people. And if you're making any of these mistakes, if you're at, because it's really just your attitude to money that's the difference between make it or break it. So if you've got the wrong twist up here, if you're doing the silly things that I'm going to mention, one of the ways to make more money immediately from tonight is to stop doing them. And then what I'm going to teach you is the way the wealthy do it. And then if you start copying those strategies and avoid the mistake strategies, you're going to end up making more money. Hopefully loads more money. So what do most people do? What most people do is they go to work. There's nothing wrong with going to work, don't get me wrong. It's what do we do with the money we earn, right? So what most people do is they save a bit, spend a bit, save a bit, spend a bit, save, 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 spend, 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 spend save, spend, save, spend, save, right? Spend. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, what's happened here? Have I gone to the beginning? I've gone to the end. It's all quick, don't look at any of that so you know what I'm doing. Quick, quick, shush, shush, shush. Work. There you go. Did I keep my finger on it and it flicked through? No. Anyway, press the wrong button. That's what most people do. We learn these habits from a very early age. What's the first thing a young person does when they leave school or college? They go get a real job, first real money in their lifetime, right? Not the part-time McDonald's job anymore. Not part-time money anymore. So the first thing they do when they get this new job and money starts coming in, they go, oh, I've got some money. They rush out and they buy an asset. Nothing wrong with buying assets. This asset they borrow money for. This asset they commit $100, $150 a week of their hard-earned money to buy this asset. This asset's called a car. car. Asset. Asset. Do yourself a favour tomorrow. Go and buy a car. Any car, drive it around the first roundabout you see, take it back to the car yard, say, oh, excuse me, I made a bit of a mistake. Now, you know, that's like, you know, are you like Kmart and Maya? Do you give refunds? Yes, we do. But unlike Kmart and Maya, they won't give you a full refund, will they? You'll get a refund less about eight or ten grand of what you pay for the car, won't you? Yeah? If you want to call that an asset, it's called a depreciating asset. Yeah? So I say to the young person, I know you needed a car, and all right, maybe a silly move, but then I see people of 55 doing the same thing, you know. They're nearing the end, and they go buy themselves a car, a bigger car. So I say to the young person, uh, that's great, and how much are you saving? Oh, they say, because now they start making excuses. You ever made an excuse why you made an expenditure? Oh, they say, I can't afford to save right now because I'm paying off the new car. But when I've paid off the new car, then I'm going to start saving. And they shake their head and they really, really mean it. Except in four years' time when they've paid off the new car, what do they go and do? Buy another one. And it's got to be more expensive than the first one, otherwise your friends will laugh at you. They'll call you an idiot. Then you've got to get a credit card, haven't you? Everyone's got to have a credit card. Now, this is clever, right? I got a credit card when I went to England about seven or eight years ago, and I got a $10,000 limit. I spent the whole $10,000. I was there 10 days, spent the whole 10,000, came back, paid the 10 grand off, and kept the frequent flyer points, right? But because I went up to my limit, and because I went there so quick, I don't know whether you've ever had the privilege of this letter you get from the bank, right? So you get the letter, it's all on one page, and it's definitely, there's a definite reason why the bank print it all on one page, right? I'll tell you in a minute. So the letter goes like this, it says, Dear Steve, like they've known me for years, noticed you've lost, gone up to your credit limit, Steve. Never mind, they say, because this happens in life, these things happen. Now we're here to help you. We understand what you're going through, so we would like to offer you another $2,500 worth of credit. Now, the good news is, Steve, you don't have to prove you're working, we don't want proof of income, we don't want proof of health, you could be dead for a week here. Just sign the bottom of this page and quickly send it in. 
right? See, if the signing page was on another sheet, you might lose the other sheet, right? So to keep it all on one letter, <laughs> clever, right? So this is what happens. You come home from work, both of you open the mail. <gasps> oh, look, darling, there's a letter from the bank. It says, because we've gone up to our limit, they will offer us another two and a half thousand dollars worth of credit. We don't even have to, pr pr we don't even have to bother that you've just lost your job. We can get another two and a half thousand dollars worth of credit. Oh, do you think we should, the other person says, because, you know, we don't really need any more. It's, no, we're not going to spend it. <laughs> no, it's there in case we need it in an emergency. Oh, is that, yeah, we won't spend it. Oh, all right, quick sign. What happens within three months? They're now in 12 and a half grand worth of debt instead of 10 grand, correct? So consequently, because of all those stupid things we do, we end up on the pension, right? So what do the wealthy do? Well, they go to work too. Great, we've got to collect an income. What they do is they save, like everyone, instead of spending it, they invest it, and then what they do is they build a thing called an asset base so that they can retire wealthy one day with loads of money. Now, you didn't need to come here tonight, you could have watched Family Food Fight, because you already knew that, right? But what I wanted to do is I wanted to concentrate on the word asset. We've just understood that certain assets aren't really assets. Like a car isn't an asset, your furniture isn't an asset. Why do they, when you fill out a loan application form, ask you what your furniture's worth? Why do they do that? And you proudly go, well, my fridge is worth $2,000 and that TV costs $12,000. You ain't gonna get it in a garage sale, are you? So it ain't worth it. It just makes you feel better, I think. But they ain't assets, folks, they ain't assets. What do the wealthy consider assets? So like maybe some of you, I've read up on what the wealthy do, not how they make their money, that's interesting too, but what do they do with the money they make, yeah? What do they do? So I found this little book, pardon me, excuse me, and I'm gonna share some tips out of this book because this, this bloke is a multi-millionaire and he learned from another multi-multi-millionaire, right? So they must be worth listening to because they've got more money than I have. But one of the things he did was describe his take on what an asset is. This book's called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Has anyone read it? Yeah, a couple of you? Or don't we put our hand up in Newcastle? Didn't you, did you not put your deodorant on? You've got to not worry about stuff like that. It's written by a guy called Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki had the benefit of learning from a rich dad and a poor dad. His own father was the head of a university. Head of a university, very clever guy, right? Really smart guy, has to be. Head of a university, he was on a six-figure income, right? So, clever guy, earning loads of money. Robert Kiyosaki's dad did that, right? And he was the poor dad. You know why he was the poor dad? Don't let, don't let circumstances or what you see with people kid you because lots of people with big houses have bigger and better debts than you, bigger and better mortgages, yeah? They drive flash cars, but they have bigger and better loans on those cars. They go to bigger and better restaurants, they buy bigger and better clothes, they have bigger and better holidays, their kids go to bigger and better schools with bigger and better school fees. That does not make them rich, does it? It means they've got a fantastic lifestyle, but if they don't protect it, that lifestyle is going to come crashing down really hard. A mate of mine bought a 180 grand Mercedes because his business was doing well. 18 months later his business wasn't doing well and he had to sell the Mercedes. Obviously he took a lease out on the whole thing, he sold the Mercedes for less than 100 grand. Still ends up owing that money, the other rest of it he's got to pay back. See, it's not flash, is it? So the rich dad in the book was also a good lesson for me. The rich dad was Robert's friend's father. He was a mechanic, truck driver, kind of knockabout guy on the street, which was handy for me because I had to go to work when I was about 14 or 15, because mum, all us kids, you know, we didn't have a dad. So get out and work. So I never had a proper education. And I was a plumber's mate. I wasn't even an apprentice plumber because I couldn't afford the low wages. I had to get as much as I could. So learning that this guy was just a knockabout truck driver mechanic type sort of guy, you know, great. And it might be some news for someone in this room. You don't have to be, have a good education and you don't have to have a high income. You just have to know how to use the money you've got, which I'll show you in a minute, all right? So Robert says to the rich guy, how'd you do it? So he says, and I really loved this when I read it. He said, look, I don't care whether you're a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, I don't care how you make your money, whether you're employed or self-employed, that doesn't mean anything. It's you're generating an income. It's what you do with the income you generate. So what you should do with the in income you generate is start a business. 
The business is called your asset base. You don't have any staff, you don't actually, it's not a business, you understand, yeah, it's not a, like a shop or something. You've just got this going on behind the scenes. You get your money that you're making. You take some of that money first and you invest it and then you spend what's left. What do most people do? They get their wages, they spend, and if there's anything left, then they'll save a bit, won't they? What happens at the end of most weeks or months? Mm, there's none left. Oh, we won't save then this week, we'll save next week. Ever done that? No. Yeah, of course you have. I have. Um, so he says that's what you should do. You should go, get, go to work, get as much of your money as you can out of that and start building a business called your assets. I like that concept. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the smart, I'm going to teach you some smarts, and safe way of building this business. Stockpiling your assets. Yeah? Two mistakes people make, please learn from their mistakes. Yeah? If you can't learn from their mistakes, it's, you know, you can learn from them, right? First mistake is people fail to plan. I promise you, I really promise you I wasn't wasting your time telling you about my red open top Alfa Romeo, telling you about the cup of coffee I wanted. What I was trying to say to you is if you've got some visions about what you want out of life, get them going, get them going, get them to motivate you. I heard that lots of people hate the job that they do. But if you knew you were doing that job because what you've got is a business that you're creating so that you can go and do whatever it is the hell you want to do for 30 years of your life, that's more exciting now. You know why you're toddling off to this job in the, uh, early in the morning in the freezing cold or whatever. So you've got to have a plan. It also helps people like us help you to plan and strategize. If you've got a plan and a strategy, you feel much better. If you're just dancing around and letting the wind blow you around from tree to tree, you don't really feel so good. I'm not as good as if you've got, I know what I'm doing. I've got it all marked out now. The other thing is people never start. Of course, I can guarantee what will happen if you never start. That's the only guarantee apart from death and taxes I'll make today. I know you'll get this if you never start. You know that, right? Or maybe you started and you stopped. I met a guy a few years back. He comes up to me, he starts telling me his story. He says he went to one of these 10 years ago. 10 years ago, he liked what the guy said, so he went and bought himself a property. Six months later, he liked it so much, he went and bought himself another one. I'm going, you're kidding, two in six months, that's fantastic. I never heard anyone do it like that before. That's great. How many you got now? I've still got the two, he said. Oh, no, no. I said, how old are you? He says, I'm 52. I said, what do you earn? He said, 120 grand a year. I said, how much are the properties worth? He said, 500 grand each. I said, that's not enough. He said, mm, and the story's not that good either, Steve. He says, uh, I borrowed, I, I took the loans out on interest only loans, which is not a bad strategy. 250 grand each. I owe 250 grand on each property, so I owe 500 grand. So I said, you're worth a mil, you owe 500. I said, you're nowhere near enough. He said, yeah, I know. It was lucky he shared the story with me because he wasn't going to do it. He thought, he was, you know, well, at least I've got two. I'm doing it, he said. He's not doing it. He's just touching the edge. So I showed him what he has to do and now he's getting a bit better off. But if you've started and you've stopped, start again. And if you've never started, the only way you're going to make any money is to get started. Grit your teeth and jump in and get started. So. The key is build a strategy around what you want out of life, what your goals are. Have that strategy, constantly work towards that strategy by sticking to it, yeah? Stick to it. Anyone ever been on a lousy diet? Oh, come on. Is it because you didn't put your deodorant on, you're not admitting to it? I have, I have, but there's no such thing. It's impossible to have a lousy diet. How can it be a lousy diet? Except the cabbage diet. Have you ever tried the cabbage diet? You only eat cabbage? You lose all your friends. <laughs> There's no such thing as a lousy diet. You know why? Because all it is is eat less energy than you ex ex excel, exude, whatever the words I'm looking for. I've lost it. Isn't it? That's how we, we all know how to lose weight. So we all really know how to make money. You've got to start doing something about it. And if you don't, we guarantee the answer. So people then say to me, Steve, that's all very well, right? Um, I've realised uh, I'm on the wrong track financially. If by the time I finish talking you go home tonight and you go, yeah, I don't think we've got enough, I think we're on the wrong track, yeah? Okay, we've got to do something about it, yeah, okay. They then say to me, Steve, 
I've got to do something about it. But, Steve, in all honesty, you know, we've got uh, the governments over here, they don't know which way to go, we don't know what's happening, we might have Pauline Hanson running the country, I don't know, we've got Trumpy and the other guy with the hair, we've got, you know, the oil price, the coal price, the this price, the that price, price of fish, whatever, right? So, Steve, look, I'm a bit confused right now. I know I've got to do something, but when is the best time to start? So, of course, I say, well, obviously the best time to start is after Christmas. I mean, you can't do anything about your finances. You can't look after yourself before Christmas. That's just totally ridiculous, because you're having Christmas at your place this year. You don't know whether it's a ham or a turkey. Should I buy some prawns? I've got Auntie Sally and Uncle Ben coming. They don't get on. I don't know what I'm going to do there. And little, little Millie, I bought her a present last year, and it was totally wrong. It was, I, I just hated myself. I've got to buy her up something better. And the Christmas lights don't work, and, and I've got to buy some wrapping paper. I can't look after myself financially. So I say, wait till after Christmas. Get all that out of the way, yeah. Whew. Yeah? Then don't do it in January because you've got rego, probably due rates, something. There's always bills in January. You've got Australia Day. February is a good time to start thinking about it. The only trouble is it's getting close to Easter. And chocolate is really important. Do you get the message? When do you reckon the best time to start is? Now. I'm too scared to say now. But it is now, isn't it? Don't you agree? I mean, if you want to change your life financially, start now. So if you were going to start now, this is what I recommend you do, right? Because now means now, today, right? So what I recommend you do is you go home. On the way home, you stop at the ATM, you get $100. You take the $100 home, you find a tin box, you put the $100 in the tin box, and you slide it under the bed. Next week, you do the same again. And the same again, you do it for four weeks. You'll have $400 saved up. You could have started four weeks ago, Christmas or no Christmas. You would have $800 saved in your name under, in that tin box under the bed. So, if you haven't got enough money for your future, why don't you start saving today? There's really no excuse, is there? But we don't want to put it into a tin box under the bed. I mean, we could for the first few weeks, but then what are we going to do with it? We've got to find something solid. So what do these type of people, these multis, what do they do with their money? Where do they put their money? Well, they basically do this with it. It's no fancier than this. And your superannuation money is invested in exactly the same way. They put their money into cash in the bank. Yeah? They buy some property and they buy some shares. Either way around, doesn't matter. That's it. The reason I mention that is because every week I, me I meet someone who wants to buck the system. They want to get fancy with it. They want to do something new. They want to try, you know, quick fix. I had a guy come to see me. I had a, 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 a National Mutual office in Ringwood in Melbourne, if any of you know Melbourne at all, right? And uh, he comes and knocks on my door. You see, because we, within six months of operation, we were in the top 10 agents in the country, not just for National Mutual, all agents. We'd done really, really well. So he comes. You get, your name gets passed around and people want to come and sell you stuff. So he's come knocking on my door. Sit down, I said, what have you got for me? So he goes, Steve, I heard you're doing really well. It's hard work, eh? I said, yes, it's hard work, but I don't care. He said, I've got the answer. I said, great, what is it? He said, well, you're a POM, ain't you? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, you won't have heard of it. It's going to be new to you. I said, that's okay. I'll accept it. What is it? He said, it's emus. Emus, I said, I have heard of emus, funnily enough. It's a bird thing with a neck, isn't it? And feathers and stuff. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Emus. I said, what the hell am I going to do with an emu? How am I going to make money out of an emu? He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, you don't have just one emu. I've got two emu chicks here. They're $6,000 each, right? And you're going to buy both of them. This is in 1989, right? You're going to buy both of them, and they're going to fall in love, get married, have loads of baby emus. I said, what am I going to do with loads of baby emus? He said, we're going to sell the meat to the Japanese. They're going to love it. They're going to go crazy for emu sushi. So I said, oh, really? I said, hey, listen, out there, I just bought that coffee machine. That's cr that chrome one out there. It's fantastic. It does a great cup of coffee. There's Tim Tams, muffins, croissants. Go help yourself and then bugger off. You know, get out of it. I'm too busy. Uh, it's a true story. But people will come and people will... Anyone bought an olive grove plantation because it was a good tax dodge? Did you? No? Forest? Anyone got a forest? My mate, I've only known him five years. Yeah, he bought a forest about 10, 15 years ago because it was a good tax dodge. Mm, nah, it didn't work. 
Good. So don't do that sort of thing, all right? Stick to the try, true and tried and trusted. Now, what a, a financial planner might show you is the pyramid shape. I like the pyramids. There was a program on the telly last night about them. Fantastic they are, right? So they were built very, very well, very strong. And one of the things they had was a strong foundation. Any building, builder will tell you that a building to stay put has to have a strong foundation. So that's how you have to view your business, your asset building business. I need a strong foundation. I'm going to focus on building this strong foundation. Because what a lot of people do, what most people do, and this is one of the reasons they fail, is they flip. They have a bit of investment here, bit over there, bit of this, try a bit of that, have a go on the Melbourne Cup, try a bit of that, do that, da -dum -dum. What you've got to do is build your foundation first, then build the next layer and so on. That's how the pyramids were built, okay? So, the width of the pyramid is how much of your money is invested. The height is the risk. So obviously the pyramid, the foundation is the widest, that's most of your money, it's the lowest, so it's the lowest risk, and then as you build, you have less money, it's higher risk, yeah, but the higher, it could have a higher return, but you've got less exposure. When you've got all that in place, it doesn't matter if you have a bit of a punt, and when you get up to there, you buy an emu, just for laughs, right? I'm joking, you can laugh at that. So, which are you going to choose as your foundation? If you're on the wrong track financially, you've got to make a decision. There's no shortcut. You can't put it off. Cash, shares or property, which one is going to be my foundation? In order to help you, you should go home tonight, start your bucket list, pour a cup of tea and then go, which one are we going to use as our foundation? Which one do we... Go with your gut a bit. You know, what do you feel? I trust your gut. These are four important ingredients that your foundation should have. Okay? This bloke's just told us two of them. Do you remember? It's got to go up in value, that's called capital growth, and it's got to give us an income, yes? Do you remember? Yep. Did I tell you that? No, I didn't. Ah. Oh. <laughs> he does say that in there. I missed that bit, that's quite important, because now it doesn't make any sense to you. Yes, Robert Kiyosaki asks him in the book, and that's his sentence. Robert says to him, what's an asset? And he says, anything that goes up in value and gives you an income. He even underlines the word and in the book somewhere. I could show you. Anything that goes up in value and gives you an income. Robert actually says to him, why and give you an income? He says, because one day you're going to want to stop work and you're not, going to want to gen you're not going to be able to generate an income anymore. So you're going to need a thing called a passive income. Those assets that you've accumulated should be giving you a passive income. Okay? So you might as well start collecting them now. That made a lot of sense to me. Here's something he did to him. Let's do this now for you. Yeah? He says to the reader of the book, do a stock take of where you're at right now. Yeah? Because it's valuable to understand where you're at. You've been working how many years? You've had how much money go through your hands? Incomes. If there's two of you, you've had two, two, two incomes maybe. Where, where are we at financially? So what I want you to do is imagine an A4 piece of paper. Yeah? Draw a line down the middle, line across the top. Do this in your head. You're not going to get asked any questions, so just do it for yourself. Head up one column, my assets. Head up the other column, my liabilities. And what you should do is list all the assets that you've got so far. What's an asset? Anything that goes up in value and gives you an income. List them all that you've got. Are you doing it? You doing it? You can go like that, I like that. Don't stare at me like that, because I can't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, have we finished? Do you need more time? No. no. Right, now, what you've got to do is then list your li liabilities, which is all the money you've pumped into things that won't go up in value and won't give you an income, right? So what happens is your liability list is this long and your asset list is this long, correct? Yeah? For some of you, it's non-existent, correct? Right. Don't let that put you off. Just let it remind you, once again, <gasps> I need to do something. That's all. And then do something about it. If, you, if this balance sheet isn't right, that's all I can say to you. The biggest way to make more money is to look at your balance sheet and go, ooh, we need to change. And start changing straight away after Easter. No, not after Easter. The third ingredient is tax advantages. This one gets very little attention. And it can be very, very, very valuable. I'm going to show you yeah, later on. Did you know, for those that you didn't know, 
that the Australian government will help you by giving you your tax dollars back if you buy assets that go up in value and give you an income. Did you know the Australian government will give you your tax dollars back if you buy assets that go up in value and give you an income and help you get rich? Why have I told you that twice? Because it amazed me when I came over here. You see, the English government does not help the English people get rich by giving them their tax dollars back so that they can go off and buy assets that will go up in value and give them an income. The English government doesn't do it. I came over here and I discovered that and I thought, what a bloody good idea. That's sensational. You see, we're so used to hearing the 86.5% of people around us moaning, yeah, about how bad the government is. We miss the good bits. Don't listen to the 86.5%. It's a fantastic thing and you should take advantage of it. Anything we can get to help us is worth it, isn't it? And they've got this in place to help us. So we should use it. The fourth ingredient is it must be low risk. Okay, because that's our lowest one, right? So we've got cash, shares and property, yeah? Which one are you going to choose? Can I help you? Do not choose cash. Why not? Well, yes, it is low risk. Your grandma was correct. Yeah, the bank is a good place to put your money, yeah. But it doesn't give you any tax advantages and it only gives you income or capital growth, whatever you want to call the interest on your money, right? Plus, that is very low. And cash in the bank is what I call a slow track way of investing. It's very slow. What the wealthy learn to do is fast track their money. They get their money working much faster. I'm going to show you how they do it. It's a strategy you sort of already really know, but you might have not viewed it this way before. So I'm just going to sort of take the blinkers off a bit. So we're going to need to get our money moving as fast as possible, don't we? We don't want our money moving slowly. It's safe and we can get it moving faster. I'll show you how we do it. So that just leaves shares and property. Which one are you going to choose? Which one do I choose? Well, they're very, very close. They are very close. I've got property first, shares second. Bit of super, bit of cash in the bank, right? Then you can play around and then get your emu, right? Oh, well, there is some cl clear cut reasons why I put the property just above, the, just in front of the shares. And it's not necessarily for the obvious, or what you think are the obvious reasons. I'm going to show you why. I'm going to go through these four ingredients and show you why I would do it that way around. You can disagree and do it the other way around, that's fine, but just do something, you know, one way or the other. But this is why. Capital growth, how did they fare? Shares and property. Well, here's a graph, went over the last 19 years. Um, shares did quite well, 12 point something percent as an average per year. That's pretty good. Property over the same period of time, oh, done it again. How did it go? Oh, not so well. Then why the hell are you recommending property if property shows less the return than shares? Well, to be quite honest with you, if I was desperately trying to push something, I could have shown you a graph that showed property miles better than shares. Or I could have shown you a graph shares miles better than property. It just depends what time frame I chose. Yeah? I'm not trying to do that here. I'm just trying to give them a, you know, an equal fairness of opportunity. And to me, property from a capital growth point of view and shares are about the same. Shares perform like this, you keep them for 10 years and they'll perform. Property is erratic, yeah? Keep it for 10 years and it will perform. Simple, yeah? So to me, property and shares both get a tick. Income. Shares give income. I'm talking about the ASX 200, which is the top 200 companies, yes? Um, if you invest in them, they give you dividends, lots of shares give you dividends, but the dividends of the top 200 are called blue chip dividends, and they are fully franked, which means, obviously, if you get income every year, you've got to pay tax on it. The fully franked ta uh, dividends are tax paid at company rate, which is about 30%. You might be a 38% taxpayer, about, yeah? So you'll pay very little tax on the income. Very good, right? Not bad. Property, where does that, does that give me income? Yeah, you don't need me to tell you that property provides an income by a tenant paying rent. But what a lot of people do ask is, do people rent? Is there a demand out there? Is it gonna stay consistent? Uh, well, here's some stats for you. 95% of people have rented a property at some point in their life. Let's try something really risky here in Newcastle. Could you put your hand up? I'm going to ask you to put your hand up, right? That's been risky for me as a venture here tonight. But I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you've ever rented a property. Go on, give it a go. 
Oh, some of you are like, Ugh. yes, good, that's most of you, isn't it? That's about 93.8% of this room, roughly. I'm good at maths. So, most of some properties that get rented by all sorts of people. 30% of homes are rented now. Walk around Australia, knock on the doors. Are you buying or are you renting? About 30% will say I'm renting, but that's on the increase. And we know why that's on the increase. People are finding it harder to get into their first home, etc., etc., etc. So what that means though, from an investor's point of view, there's an interesting stat that now people know they've got to rent. They don't want to buy a six month lease anymore. There's 12 months and sometimes two years. A mate of mine got a three year lease the other day because people are sick and tired of moving around. They know they're going to be renting. I don't want to keep changing house every six months. I want to stay there. So they lock down with it and they make the place nice. And so they're good tenants. I know you only hear stories on 60 Minutes about bad tenants. That's because good tenants don't sell advertising, do they? If you think about it, right? So if there's an ad on the telly, tonight on 60 Minutes is a really good tenant who's really happy and so is the landlord and there's been nothing gone wrong ever. You must watch this. It's not going to happen, is it? Yeah? So we just want to know about the one that kills sheep on the lounge room carpet. <laughs> so we'll view that, won't we? Right, so capital growth, they both get a tick. Income, they both get a tick. So now they're level pegging. Tax advantages. The law says, and I'm going to squash it down, the rule says something like, if you invest into anything that is income producing, any expenses associated with that income production are tax deductible, right? Any expenses. So you're going to invest in emus, you've got to buy the chook wire and the chook food and all of that, that's tax deductible. You invest in shares, are there any tax deductions? Well, maybe a bit of account keeping fees, there might be a bit of this and a bit of that. If you've borrowed the money, the interest on the bo money borrowed, just the interest payment, is tax deductible. And that's about it for shares. Property, well an investment property is exactly like the one you're living in, yeah? It has all sorts of expenses, they're exactly the same. They're the same type of house, it's just that you don't live in both of them. They have expenses. And are they tax deductible? So to answer that question for those of you that don't know, yes they are. And just so I've done a uh, slide here that shows you what's tax deductible. Doesn't show you every single thing, but it just recognises that yes, the rates are tax deductible, the insurances are tax deductible, the interest on the money borrowed, just the interest payment. That's why it's okay to go interest only loan because the principal payment isn't tax deductible. If you've got any extra money, don't pay it off your investment property. Get rid of your own home first. Get rid of your car debts. Get rid of your credit cards. Get rid of all that first because it's not tax deductible. Leave your investment as tax deductible as much as possible, right? Once you're debt free over here, you can start being debt free over here. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. Okay, management fees. Management, that goes to the real estate agent, get a real estate agent to look after it for you. It does help, I find it. I just like buying mine, chuck them in the corner, get, the, get Ray White or somebody to look after them. Um, you don't know, you can look after them yourself, but I just don't, can't be bothered. Maintenance is tax deductible, but don't be daft, right? It's a tax deduction, it doesn't mean a full refund. Do not buy something that's deliberately high maintenance. Yeah? New is far better than old as far as maintenance goes. You've got builder's guarantees and things as well. Um, you don't need a lot of maintenance. So be low maintenance about it. Don't, you know. A lick of paint is not a tax deduction. Some plants to pretty up the garden, and it might add value, but it's not a tax deduction, okay? Now, he, these things all cost us money, yeah? There are some little cherries on the cake that don't cost us any money, but they're tax deductions. And I love a freebie. So what the government will do is they will allow us to depreciate the cost of construction of the property. And I'm now gonna tell you something that could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax deductions to you. Your real estate agent won't tell you, your bank manager won't tell you, your financial planner may not tell you, uh, your tax agent definitely probably wouldn't, um, but I will way, way better than watching Family Food Fight. This could be worth a fortune to you, right? The rule is this. We can claim 2.5% a year on the cost of construction, not the whole total cost of the property, the cost of construction, yeah, for a maximum of 40 years, okay? 40 years times 2.5, 40 times 2.5 is 100. That means we can write off 100% of the building cost 
on that property. Once it's 40 years old, we can't carry it on. We, it's not that we own, own it for 40 years. It's, you understand that, yeah? 40 years of the property. You can also split the building's depreciation and the fixtures and fittings. See what I've done there? The carpets, the curtains, the air conditioning, etc., can be depreciated at a faster rate if, if it's beneficial to you. It may not be. So we have to help you decide that. But anyway, let's go back to the 2.5% to keep life easy. You've got it, 2.5% on the cost of construction for a maximum of 40 years. Yeah, we got that? Please nod. Right. Here's an example. You have decided with your partner that you're going to go and buy a property. You've narrowed it down to two properties just down the road here. One is in Robertson Drive and the other's just around the corner in Smith Street. You know what I mean, don't you? No, I made that up, right? Right. So, they are both worth, because I can do the maths, $400,000 each. Yes? They are both in the same area and the same type of house so capital growth, remember our four checklists? The capital growth, yeah, is going to be exactly the same. Because they're the same type of house, the rent is going to be exactly the same. So tick, tick, got me? The one in Robertson Drive is brand new, just finished on the weekend. The Smith Street one is 20 years old, okay? But here's some other very, very, very important things you need to know about Smith Street. I try, I, it's not too technical, but try and remember it all, right? So, Smith Street is 20 years old. Around the fence line is a beautiful white, freshly painted picket fence. It's beautiful. Over that picket fence are roses. They are the best roses you've ever seen in your life. See them at Flemington, right, on the Melbourne Cup Day. These are even better and they smell glorious, right? The fence itself surrounds the best lawn in Australia. It's immaculate. And in the middle of the lawn is a lemon tree. Beautiful, beautiful lemons with green, shiny leaves. And the house itself has been freshly painted. It's a picture. That's very important. Right, so it's Saturday morning. You're going to get up early and you're going to go house hunting. You're going to start attacking this new business called asset building. Off you go. You have 12 week weeks each because you're going to get lots of energy, drive down to Robertson Drive. Pull up outside Robertson Drive house, number 14. <gasps> oh, I like that. You both go, that's nice, I like that. Yeah, let's buy it. Oh, look, we've had 14 Weetabix, can we just go around the corner? We, you know, it's only, let's look, we should look above. All right then. You drive around the corner, pull up outside Smith Street and you go, <gasps> one person in the car goes, <gasps> oh, wow. Oh, look at that picket. Oh, look at those roses. Oh, look at that. Le I love lemon tree. Oh, my God, the thing's been freshly painted. It's like, oh, what a picture. I'm going to take a photograph. Quick, 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 quick. Let's buy this one. The other person in the car goes, let's just do the checklist. Like Steve, you know, capital growth, income, yeah. Tick, tick, yeah, they both got the same capital growth. Yeah, both same income. Tax deduction. Now, the one around the corner is brand new. We got it for 400 grand. The brand new is made up of two components, any houses, land component and build component, correct? Yeah. Can we go half each, 50-50, yeah? Half for land, half to build it. So 200 grand land, 200 grand to build it. That means the Robertson Drive one, we can claim 2.5% on 200 grand for 40 years. Yeah? Got it? Don't have to calculate it. Got it? 2.5 on 200 for 40. Smith Street, it is also worth 400 grand, but it was built 20 years ago. Let's say property doubles every 10 years just to make life easy. So if it's worth 400 grand today, it was worth 200 grand 10 years ago, and it was worth 100 grand 20 years ago. Got it? 100 grand, half for land, half to build it. 50 grand to build it. If you think about it, 20 years ago, it probably was only 50 grand to build a house, right? So that means we can claim 2.5% on 50 grand for 20 years. Got it? 2.5 on 50 for 20, or 2.5 on 200 for 40. This one, the brand new one, not only is it lower maintenance, etc., forget that, it is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more in tax deductions than an old one. Fact. The other person in the car goes, I don't care, I like this one, I like this, I like the lemon tree, I like the freshly painted, I like, let's buy this one. So you end up buying that one. And I'm sorry ladies, the, 
if your husband insists on buying the one with the lemon tree, <laughs> it's a lemon. Hmm, that's good. No one said that before. Do you get it? What people do is they make a mistake and they buy with this, their heart. You liked it when I said I'll show you the smart and safe way. Yeah? I've just shown you a smart that really, if you go and buy a house for a, it's not the real estate agent's fault because they're not taught what I've just taught you. So the real estate agent doesn't think like that, right? So they go, oh, this one's nice, it's got a lemon tree, this, that and the other. You're never going to see the lemon tree because you ain't going to live in it, are you? If it was your own house, different matter. But why buy with your heart when it's money-making decision? I drive through suburbs, right? I like living near the water. I'll only ever probably live near the water because I like living near the water. And I drive through suburbs, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, and I go, oof, why do people live right out here? Because they're all near the water, all those cities I've just mentioned, right? And they could live, and I go, why do, and then I, st and I go, well, there's thousands of people living in this suburb. They must be okay living in this suburb. I'm going to make money out of that. And I buy something and I never want to look at it again. Why would I? You know? If you buy shares, you don't go and visit the company head office every week, do you? You're still here? Yeah? You don't have to look at the house. You ain't going to blow away on the breeze. Anyway, back to the this, this. Uh, I've got 45 grand's worth of tax deductions nearly, okay? The property is bringing in a rent, which is the opposite of tax deductions. It's a taxable income. So I have to take the income away from my tax deductions. That leaves me with a net deductible figure of 26 grand. I can lower my taxable income by 26 grand. I've already paid tax on it, so I'm going to get a tax refund on that 26 grand, correct? And you say, oh, Steve, right, great. I've got how it works, but are you kidding? I've got to wait till next June, July. I mean, I don't do my tax returns in July, so by the time I do my, it's nearly a year away before I get that tax refund. Wrong. Not only do we get the tax refund in the first place, which I think is brilliant, because you certainly won't get it in England. Not only do we get it over here, in, in, which is great help, if we fill in a thing called a tax variation form, we can tell the tax department, we do this for our clients, that we're going to make a 26 grand claim. He says, OK, I'm going to write to your boss. And he will say to your boss, please do not tax that person so much anymore. I want them taxed less because they're going to make a claim. So in other words, you get the tax deduction in advance. In advance. So wonder we get it at all, but we get it in advance. You haven't had the expenses and you're getting it. You will walk home with an extra $150, $200 in your pay packet. Extra. You can't spend it. Because it's designed to pay, help pay the costs of owning this thing. Now if this is the cost of owning this thing, it's about 30 grand, right? Yeah, add that up, it's about 30 grand. So if it's going to cost us 30 grand to own this asset within my business, so my business is to buy these assets, I've got a yearly cost of 30 grand to, in my business. Where the hell am I going to get the 30 grand from? This pie chart is the 30 grand, right? The, Who pays the 30 grand? The tenant will pay you rent each week or fortnight. The taxman will pay you $150, $200, give you back your taxable income. Give it back. And if there's a shortfall, the red bit, you find the shortfall. Oh, well, how much is the shortfall, Steve? Typically, worst, worst, worst case scenario, it's $100 a week. So, instead of putting $100 a week in a tin box under the bed, you can have another house. Your own house costs you more than $100 a week especially if you've got a mortgage on it. The one that you run out and buy and the one that you, you know, loads of people have got their own house. They're very proud and so they should be. You know, I've got my own house. They're still going to fail financially because they can't find the $100 a week to go and buy another one. In fact, some people rent and have a stream of other properties because they're only costing them $100 a week and then they'll go and buy their, their own one for cash sell some of them and buy some for that. I mean, that's a weird concept, so I don't want to get into that too much. 
But what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, for a hundred bucks a week, you can have another house. Now, here's the cruncher. Here's one of the reasons, or towards the reasons why I like property over shares, right? Because if you get this next little concept, if you understand this next little concept, you will understand how to rich get richer. And you will understand how to fast track your money, because this is the concept, it's as simple as this. The reason we can have another house for $100 a week is because we are using opium. Not opium, OPM, other people's money. This is the cruncher. The more opium you can use, the quicker your portfolio will grow. We've got to be opium users. I'm being recorded here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Other people's, who in this situation is the other people? The tenant and the tax man. Because until you started this, tra this strategy, you were happy to just let your tax go down the, well not down the drain, but to the tax man. Half of it goes down the drain. Um, now you're getting it back. And you're getting some other guy called the tenant giving you money and you are buying this asset so what you're doing is you're using a small amount of your money to gain a much larger asset right let me show you if we are using a hundred dollars which is five thousand dollars a year roughly yeah we are gearing that up to a 400 grand asset now here's one thing I like about property I know, because statistics tell me, and I've lived long enough to see it happen for myself, to not have to argue with myself about this, so I'm suggesting you don't either, because you know I'm right. Property will double in value every seven to 10 years, right? I know it will, in any decent area. I can show you lots of areas that won't double, so we avoid them like the plague. But there's plenty more, there's more areas that will double than areas that won't double quite frankly. So I know if this is my strategy, I'm going to find myself $100 a week. This is my business, yeah? Whether it's the fifth, tenth, twentieth element of my business or the first element, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find $100 a week, I'm going to get this thing for 400 grand. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to use somebody else's opium. Whose opium do I use? The banks, right? That's what they're in business for. They supply funds so that people can borrow the money and they live off the interest, right? That's how they make money. So we can use their money. The bit you need to understand is the more opium you can safely get, yeah, safely and comfortably, it has to be comfortable for you, the more money you're going to make. Because when this thing doubles in value in 10 years, it's going to be worth 800 grand. My strategy is to sell it in 10 years time. So in 10 years time from today, I'm gonna to sell it. I still owe the bank the 400 because I had it on an interest only loan. I pay back the bank 400 and I keep what's left. Now there's a Mr. Negative in the room, right? He's got negative stuff going through his head. I'm gonna deal with you in a minute, Mr. Negative, all right? Don't worry, I'll answer your negatives, okay? Couple of them anyway. But getting back to my business, let's go one step at a time, Mr. Negative, yeah? I put $100 a week into my business, five grand a year. I did it for 10 years, which means into my business I contributed $50,000 over a 10 year period and I turned it into 400 grand. That's it, that's how it works. Now if you understand that you can see that if I can get the bank's money working for me and I can use other people's money like the tenant and the tax man to pay for the cost of the bank's money, yep, that's how I'm going to make money. I've turned 50 into 400. So it's called gearing as you can see. You've heard, some of you have heard the phrase and probably never really understood, well you know it's just a word you know. But you're gearing or leveraging up your money. That's the way to fast track your money. Do you think Richard Branson uses his own money when he wants another jumbo jet? No, he uses the bank's money. Developers who develop, you know, real estate, you know, 
uh, townhouses or, or, or high rises or shopping centres. They use the bank's money. They just know how to manage it. So all you have to do is understand if you buy this thing, I don't care what it looks like, yeah, you just have to understand the money management of it. And if it boils down to you having to contribute 100 and you're comfortable with the 100, go get the 400 grand. So, if the bottom line is we want 400 grand working for us, this is one reason, I, another reason I like property. You walk into the bank, I've got to get 400 grand from the bank manager, I've got to get 400 grand. Mr. Bank Manager, I want to borrow 400 grand. He says, what do you want to borrow it for? I say, I want to buy some emus. He goes, what? Get out of here, you idiot, right? You go in the next day, Mr. Bank Manager, I want 400 grand, what for? I want to buy some shares. Oh, he goes, I don't mind shares. Um, let me ask you, how much are you contributing to this venture? Oh, I'm, I'm putting in $100 a week. Mm, that's five grand a year. Okay, I'll give you 10. He'll give you two to one. So now you manage to gear up to 10 grand. Wasn't the goal, the goal was 400 grand. Mr. Bank Manager, I want to borrow, for, what for? I want to buy a property. Oh, he says, come this way. Uh, please sit here, can I shine your shoes? Would you like a tea or coffee? Would you like some muffins, Tim Tams, croissants? Because you see, the fact of the matter is, they will lend much more money against the security of property than they will the security of a share portfolio. So if your aim is to gear up as comfortably as possible, you want as much money working for you, you choose property over shares because that's what the banks do. They make billions, don't they? They have a bigger loan book on property than they do on shares. Fact. Go ask them. So if they do it that way around, I sure as hell ain't going to break the wheel. I'm going to copy them. And that's why I suggest it. That's why I said to you, it probably isn't for the obvious answer. It's just simply, I can gear higher with property than I can with shares. Okay? Now Mr. Negative goes, yeah, 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 but you've got to pay capital gains tax on that. Let me just address this tax thing, because this is how most people think. Is that a negative to not do it? I don't think so, is it? I mean, let me explain something to you about tax. I want to offer you all a job, yeah? You're going to get this job and you can start as soon as you want, right? The job is well within your capabilities, you can do it, and it pays $360,000 a year. Would you take the job? I only got one nod then, two nods. <laughs> You wouldn't take the job or we're not playing the game? You would take the job, wouldn't you? Yeah. The catch is this, the tax is $145,000. Would you still take the job? Yeah. Yes, you're gonna have to pay capital gains tax on that. Of course you are. We have to pay tax on money we make. But it's on half the gain, 200 grand. Half the gain at your marginal rate of tax at time of selling. So if you sell at a low marginal tax rate, you ain't going to pay much tax, are you? Maybe pay 60, 80 grand in tax. Would you still not do it? Isn't it better to make the 400 and pay the tax than not make the 400? Here's something that I know about lots of people, right? Lots of people can find the $100 a week. So over a 10 year period, you'd find your 50 grand. Would you ever, ever, over a 10 year period, save $400,000. So, if you don't, you've got two choices, you see. In this money making business, you've got two choices. You are either gonna decide you are gonna gear, even if it's scary, you're gonna grit your teeth, I'm gonna gear, I'm gonna get some opium. Or you're not gonna gear, because you can't half gear, can you? You're either gonna do it, Oh, you're not going to do it. It's like you can't be half pregnant. You've got to do the whole hog or nothing, right? If you're not going to gear, you can only use this money here. You can only get growth on your hundred dollars a week, five grand a year. If you get 10% return on five grand a year, you're making 500 a year. Yeah? Or you can get 1% return on this, and you make $4,000 a year. Do you get me? I mean, very simplistic with the maths there, but that's how it works. Leveraging your money, you must make more money. Okay? Now, is it $100? Do I even have to find the $100? Here's a real example. This is a couple, 
I can't name them, obviously. We found them a, a, a what's called a dual occupancy, it's sort of like a, like a duplexy thing. It cost 539 grand. They had $25,000 worth of purchase costs, like stamp duty, legal fees, etc. right? So they needed a total of 564,000. How much of that could we get from the bank? All of it, 100% geared, yeah? No deposit. I'll show you later how we can do that. I'll tell you another time. The rate, let's say it was 4.8. You can get cheaper than that, I know. So again, I'm going over the top here with my projection. Their rate of tax was 38%. The property provided us with $550 a week rent, yes? The interest on the money borrowed is 27 grand. The property expenses are seven grand. You know, the maintenance, the rates, blah, blah, blah. That's a total of 34 grand nearly, which is $650 a week. We're getting 550 a week, so we're $100 short. But the tax man wants to chip in. So at 38%, we got seven grand a year back from the tax man which is 133, we only needed 100, we're $33 positive each week. He's got more money coming in after he went and bought the house than he has went before he bought the house. Doesn't have to be $100 if you buy correctly. Yeah? Now the other source of money that you may or may not have, and we can do all of what I've just described, with your superannuation money, maybe, if you've got enough. But let me just share it for those of you in the room that might be able to take advantage of this. You can now run your own thing called a self-managed superannuation fund, SMSF, self-managed super fund. You set up your self-managed super fund and that can be owned by a maximum of four people, okay? All four people contribute into that fund, can be just one of you, can be two of you, can be four of you. You contribute into that fund with your super money that's sitting there with AMP or whoever it is, I'm not bagging AMP, I'm bagging, you know, I'm not even bagging anyone, but you're not happy with what's happening there. You, can, you can't leverage your money in a super fund if it's AMPs looking after it, can you? You're only going to ever get growth on your own money, right? So what this allows you to do is leverage your money. You need a minimum of about 180 grand. The reason being is the bank will not lend you 100, well they will not gear 100% in a super fund. They'll only lend you about 70%, okay? So you need a bigger deposit. Whatever your proportion of your money goes into that super fund is always yours. So if you team up with your brother and his wife and then you fall out and they want to kill you, they cannot touch your money, right? Because whatever your proportion is in the fund, it always stays your proportion. So that's why I like it. But it allows you to leverage. Lots and lots of people are <coughs> turning from normal superannuation into self-managed super funds for what, the, leveraging is one of the key reasons, okay? It gives you control. So now you know what that money is doing, yeah? Um, you, you don't necessarily, if you've got, um, it gives you consolidation too. If you've got more than one super fund, which loads of people have, you've got lots of, four times the fees, four times the insurances probably. And, and, and you're not in control of that. So it, it allows you to have enough insurance. There was an article in the paper today saying loads of people, particularly as we get older, we're overinsured. Um, we don't need so much insurance, but there's, there's always a standard amount of insurance that's usually taken out in an industry super fund. It gives you the ability to leverage, so you can borrow and you have more than just your money working for you. You've got that concept now, haven't you? Okay. At the age of 60, you've got two choices. You can sell it or keep it. If you sell it, there is no capital gains tax. Okay. Or if you keep it, there is no tax on the rent. So it's tax-free income. Okay. So it's quite a good option, isn't it? Um, the past 16 years, SMSFs have performed at an average rate of 9%. Industry is about 5%. So there's a very good reason that if you've got enough money or you can team up with other people and you can get enough together, it's got to be worth investigating. So at least investigate it, if nothing else, okay? So where to from here? People say to me, Steve, if it's this good, yeah? If it means I don't even have to find $100, I might be positively geared rather than negatively. People often ask me, they say, so why isn't everybody doing it, Steve? First thing I say to them is, why are you worried about everybody? 86.5% of them are going down the tubes. Only worry about yourself, ever. You know, I mean, we all care about other people, but you know, financially. Look after yourself first. 
Secondly, I tell them the fact is, the reason why most people aren't doing it is fear. There is a fear element. It means borrowing another half a million dollars. I'm nearly debt free. You come along to an evening like this. You say, I don't want to watch Family Food Fight tonight. I'm going to go and watch this pommy guy. And this pommy guy says to you, psst, come here, psst, 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 psst. you know how to make loads of money? Go borrow another half a million. And you go, are you nuts? I can't stand the borrowing. Because we're sort of fearful of this debt situation and we're not sure if we're in control. So I just wanted to finish with a brilliant strategy to show you and how to be in control, okay, of the bank's opium. Let me just get this going here. Right, first thing I wanna do, first thing I wanna do is um, I wanna talk about mortgages, because most of you have got a mortgage, I'm assuming, right? So let's just use a 100 grand mortgage. Say we've got a mortgage taken out for 20 years and it's $100,000, right? You repay back the bank, just to keep figures round, $1,000 per month, which is 12 grand a year. Now, if you pay back the bank 12 grand a year for 20 years, how much have you repaid to the bank? Correct, $240,000, right? You all knew, didn't you, that you paid back the bank a lot more than you borrowed? Did you all know that? Yeah. Yeah, we all laugh about that. I still remember, I bought my first house when I was 21, and I still remember the annual summary. I thought I must have paid a whack off. I ended up paying about $500 off, and you've been paying a thousand bucks a month. You think, how's that? Anyway, one of the first things we've got to do, if you've got any debt, mortgage, car, credit cards, we've got to kind of manage that, because it's not tax deductible, and it's very, very expensive, even the mortgages, right? So. We want to get help you get rid of that mortgage really quickly. Now, a lot of people are paying their mortgage back weekly or fortnightly to get rid of it quickly. Anyone doing that? Yeah, great, good. Let me explain. For fortnightly payments work. The most obvious reason why it works is you're making 24 uh, fortnightly payments instead of 12 monthly payments, okay? So you're making um, extra payment. 26, sorry, yeah, 26 fortnightly payments and 12, I've lost my maths there, 12 monthly payments, right? You know what I mean. So you're making extra payments there. But the other reason it works is a sort of a technical one. It's all based on how the interest is charged on your mortgage. The interest is charged on the daily balance. So each day, your com the computer, the bank's computer, goes into your mortgage and says, how much do you owe today? And it charges you one day's worth of interest. All right? Adds it up, charges it out monthly. So, if you make a payment halfway through the month, you are lowering the daily balance, aren't you? You've made a payment, yeah? So when the computer goes in the next day, it says, how much do you owe today? Oh, you don't owe quite so much today, I won't charge you so much. So it charges you a little bit less for the rest of the month, okay? But you keep the payment the same. So you're making an extra payment there as well. If you only did that for a year, it wouldn't hardly have any effect. But you do it over the life of the mortgage, it's gonna help you get rid of the mortgage a bit quicker, isn't it, yeah? And it does. So some clever clogs some years ago, I think it was Citibank come up with the first type of one, um, said how can we help people lower the daily balance as often as possible throughout the month, yeah? So they come up with an account the most modern one that some of you have got, lots of you have got probably, is a thing called an offset account. Yeah, we got one of them, yep. It's like a type of savings account for those that you don't know. Whatever you put in this offset account, you can take straight out. But whatever the balance is in this offset account offsets what you pay interest on in your mortgage. So if that's your mortgage and you've got this much in your offset account, you're only gonna pay this much interest. You with me? So if, you've got, if you're saving up for Christmas, you put it in your offset account. You don't need another savings account anymore. It offsets here. If you're a self-employed hairdresser and you've got cash money coming in each day and you need that money to buy hairspray at the end of the month, you save it in this account, it offsets, yeah? What if you're not self-employed and got cash? What if you're not saving for Christmas? What if you just you know, run out of money each month or week? What can you do? Can you take advantage of this? Yes, you can. Let me just show you. I'm going to assume 
that you and your partner get paid monthly and you bring home $1,000 a month between you, okay? So, $4,000, sorry, $4,000 a month, $1,000 a week. So, what we do is when we get our four grand, we pay it into our mortgage and we're going to reduce the daily balance to 96 grand, correct? Yep. You say, fantastic. But how the hell, Steve, are we going to eat if I'm putting all my wages into my savings account? So I've got a solution. Cracker biscuits and water. <laughs> no, it's a credit card, right? I've talked about credit cards, I've bagged them. But if we use them correctly, we can use the credit card company's money to make us money. What we do is we live on the credit card company's money, okay? We do our tap and go, tap and go, tap and go. You need very little cash nowadays. You need a cash for a newspaper, a bit of this, but even a coffee now you can just tap and go, can't you? So you keep as much of your money in the offset account, all right? At the end of the month, the, you must not go stupid with the credit card. Obviously, don't go buy a racehorse or something with it, right? So you, got, you do your normal spending. Now, we needed $1,000 for the mortgage, remember? And we spend the other 3000 The credit card bill comes in. We take the three grand out of here. The balance will go up to 99,000. We completely swipe the credit card. No sort of part payments anymore, you know, no minimum payments anymore. Get that out of your vocabulary. We're gonna wipe the credit card. We live on the credit card company's money interest free for a month. Get some frequent flyer points as well. Little bonus, right? People come up to me and say, Steve, you forgot to mention the frequent flyer points. So I've started to remember now. Now, this is at the end of the month. What happens at the end of the month? The very same day or the very next day, our four grand comes in, balance is down to 95 grand, and so on. Got it? So we start at 100, we want to end up at zero. The balance is going to zigzag on its way down. It will come down much faster, much faster. Typical circumstances, normal incomes, normal expenditure, this 20 year mortgage could be gone in half the time. Half the time. How much was it gonna cost us to pay that mortgage back? 240 grand, remember? I've just shown you a way of paying it off in half the time, haven't I? And psst, come here. It works. It works. So go do it after Easter, <laughs> no, tomorrow. But, because all this is about human elements, right? I've just shown you a way of paying off your mortgage in half the time, and you can do that, right? But, tell me this, if this was you in 10 years time, the day you've paid your mortgage off, are you automatically $120,000 richer? You're not, are you? It just means you don't need the mortgage payment next month, doesn't it? It's 10 years early, so of course not. Yeah, exactly. So the only way you can become 120 grand richer is next month you save your mortgage payment. And you save your mortgage payment every month for 10 years and then you'll have the 120 grand, won't you? You are not automatically richer just because you got rid of your mortgage. What do most people do the next month when they go, oh, we don't have to pay our mortgage this month. What are they gonna do with that grand? Go spend it. We need a holiday. We need a new car. We need a new telly. So what we've learned is that's the fool's way of doing it. But what I've just shown you is a very fantastic way of managing the money. So this is what you should do, right? We've agreed that you should do things now, not after Easter. So tomorrow, go change the way you pay your mortgage back, okay? In your lunch break tomorrow, I want you to go buy a house. Okay? Well, we'll do it all tomorrow and then you don't have to worry about it, right? So, when that house becomes yours, I'm obviously joking, you're not going to do it tomorrow, are you? Can we lighten up? Um, but, when this house becomes yours, right? There's something fantastic that happens that most people don't consider. Boy, this weather, the family food fight tonight, I tell you. What we're going to do is we're going to get rent coming in. The tax man's going to give us his money. You are either $33 positive or you've got to find 50 bucks or something, right? There's a third element there, okay? What you've just done in your business of asset building, 
you've just created cash flow. Right? You cannot spend any of that cash flow because it's for the costs of the property, right? We understand that. You remember the pie chart? Yep. Yeah? But that money comes in to pay the bills and the bills aren't due. So you've got to save that money somewhere, haven't you? Where would you save that money? Yeah, of course. So, we then pump, that's 30 grand a year, right? You're pumping an extra 30 grand a year cash flow, reducing the daily balance, right? It must get rid of your mortgage even quicker, mustn't it? Of course. So let's say, instead of 10 years, we get rid of it in eight years. Gotta go and buy a new pen. Eight years. I've just shown you a way of being debt free two years quicker because you went and got more debt. Remember the thing that most people are scared of, you know? <gasps> Hang on a second. That more debt creates cash flow, which helps me get rid of debt. Got it? That's pretty clever, isn't it? Because it works. In eight years' time, you are now debt-free on here. No more car debt, no more. Now, one of the things I notice when I go and see someone, particularly, you know, they're getting on, they're 50-somethings, and I say to them, they've just bought a car and they've still got 200 grand on their mortgage or whatever the hell the situation is, and I say to them, what's your exit strategy? What, how are you going to get out of this situation by the time you want to retire? Oh, no one has an exit strategy. Here's your exit strategy. I've just shown you how to become debt-free on your own home. Debt-free will include the car loan, the credit card, boom, everything, right? In eight years' time, you've got a $1,000 mortgage payment that you don't need anymore. So instead of spending it on a holiday, we pay it off this one. Yeah? We have a line of credit attached to this one now, an offset account. We put this money through it, put our wages through it. This debt is going to come down even quicker, isn't it? But we don't wait, thanks. We don't wait eight years. In two years' time, we want more cash flow. So you go buy another one. Yep, because you're going to get more, more, more. In four years, three or four years' time, five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten. And each time, you're getting more cash flow. You got it? Can you sense the snowballing effect? Because the more cash flow I've got, the quicker I can get rid of debt. And then I can attack this one and so on, right? So, 10, 15 years time. The more, the younger you are, the more time you've got, just quite simply, the more money you'll make. Because it's all about time, really. And, and obviously constantly keeping the wheels turning and building this asset business. But let's say it's 15 years time. Let's say you have got six there. You're debt free on your own home, car, credit cards, la la la. You're not debt free on your investment portfolio. Your business has still got debt. So, we sell two of them. I'm not an advocate of selling them because if we sell them, we've got no passive income coming in. But we sell two of them to clear the debt on the other four. I don't know which two, it doesn't matter. Whichever two have performed the best. If they doubled every seven years, there's double doubling going on there, isn't there? You wipe the debt, you've got four properties. Let's say $500 a week rent each coming in. That's $2,000 a week and you don't have to get out of bed. You could be having a cup of coffee in the south of France with me. We could share emu photos. I mean, if you get that far ahead, you've got to buy yourself an emu, hey? How's your emu going? Oh, he's a little tiger. <laughs> That's a pretty good strategy, isn't it? You've seen, it's taken us a journey, but we've had to spend the time to go through everything to arrive at that, so you fully, everybody in the room fully understands. Some of you are different speeds to others, okay? So I hope that what I've done is I've stepped you through and so you see how plainly you can achieve that. You, obviously there are bits and pieces that I haven't been able to cover, you know? And so that's where people with experience do become experts. People who've got portfolios. Jackie, you met Jackie on the way in. She's the director of Unlock Your Financial Future. She, she won't mind me telling you, it's, she gets a bit embarrassed about it, but she bought 10 last year, right? That's someone you can listen to, you know? 
I've got, I've, I've got properties in England, let alone over here, you know. So it's just experience. We have the experience. If whatever you do, you've got more experience than I have. You know, it's just so we know what we're doing. And yeah, so we can call ourselves experts, all right? How do we help you? Well, we have our process. It starts with this evening, with me going through things, showing you how it works, all right? What we then need to do is get together with you individually. And the reason for that is we have to do like a financial health check, a bit like a general checkup at your doctor's for health. That's how I found out I had a skin cancer. That's what that is, if any of you are wondering. I didn't have a... I want to say I dodged a bullet or something, you know, in a bank raid, but I can't. The kids might believe me. Um, we evaluate and analyse that uh, information that you give us, okay? We take it away, have a look. We want to come up with a strategy for you. We show you the strategy. You might go, I don't like red, I want blue, this, that, and we might tweet it a bit, okay? Finally, we help you get started, and then it's also about putting the process in place. If it's property, we've got to find you a tenant. We've got to find you a property manager. We've got to do your, your tax variation form, stuff like that. We organise all of that. We organise the property. We find the property for you. We're not aligned to anyone. Uh, so we're totally independent, but we can look all over Australia because we have people all over Australia looking for us, for our clients. 80% um, of our business is referral business, which means people have recommended their friends to us, which is a good sign because they wouldn't recommend if they weren't happy. So, we gave you a form on the way in. Hopefully you had time to start filling that form out. What I want you to do, did I tell you I made you some sandwiches and things today? Yeah? You'll love them. If you want the recipe, I will give you the recipe. Go grab a sandwich, cup of tea, come back, finish filling the form out. Then what we need, I need one sheet on that form somewhere. Can I see that thing? You haven't filled it out yet, you two lazy things. What's going on here? Oh, you were late. Yeah, right. See the back one? I need that anyway, regardless, okay? Um, because when we've been giving tablets out in the past, uh, people have rung up and said, I never received a tablet, and we know full well because we knew the numbers we've given out. We've given everyone one. I'm sorry it sounds yucky, doesn't it, in this day and age, but this is our receipt. If we've got this, you've given us, um, we've given you the tablet. Is that all right? Is that fair enough? Yeah? No? <laughs> I'll give one up with the nodding. <laughs> Thank you, I hope it is fair enough. So, the more information you can give us right now, the more we're prepared for when we come and see you. We also need a time that we can come and see you. And what I'll get you to do, Jackie's at the back there, so when you're ready, go see Jackie and just discuss a time. It should really be within the next week or so. I'm not sure what the diaries are, Jackie knows more. But uh, let's see you. The cost of the appointment. The cost of the appointment has increased because um, the staff, you know, were complaining and stuff. So it's increased from a cup of tea and one Tim Tam to a cup of tea and two Tim Tams. There is no cost. And who knows, I don't care whether you bought five yesterday or you were made unemployed yesterday, if you don't start setting up a strategy around what your current situation is, um, you're likely to lose out. So we can help in all sorts of situations. We've got all sorts of, we've got experts at setting up superannuation funds, we've got financial planners that understand everything that I've just said to you, we've got finance brokers that can help set the finance for you, we use all the banks. And we've got property guys that will find you a great property that will have maximum tax deductions. See, your real estate agent won't do that. Um, so make an appointment with us. Let us come and see you and we'll see where we go. Thank you for your time. Please um, wander up, grab a sandwich, come back, relax, grab a cup of tea and uh, start seeing Jackie. <laughs>